So we're kind of like in equinox mode. We are just still shifting. Still shifting. In our channel in YouTube, we have a few comments, more specifically the last episode, episode four with Brian, when we discussed autonomy, tradition, training, and some other things. And uh, there was academic Stewart who posted a comment, which with a couple of questions, which I think that were very interesting. We do respond to people that really want to engage with us. So he says, hi, I enjoyed the episode. Some questions I am left with are, so the first question is, if the physical body emits or reflects spiritual power, does this sexual arouser play a role, do you think? I think it can. However, right, I would say that we are not a sex cult but we are a fertility cult. And I think those can be seen as two different things, you know, two different, two different sides, maybe of the same, of the same form. What do you think? We are fertility cults. I think that we know how to emit and reflect spiritual power other than through sexual means. That's what I would answer. Thank you. <laughs> Then the other one is, is Gardner refusal to initiate homosexuals due to a belief that the inability to find the opposite sex attractive becomes a hindrance to the flow of power? We don't know what Gardner he, thought. We don't. There, there's nothing that he has written that explicitly explains if he would or would not initiate a homosexual. We don't know. Very don't know. difficult to know when a, a, a a cult is done in secret, I mean, no. in private. So it's it's very difficult to know these things because the identity of the people that are involved, even at the time. So we can't really say that he refused because we don't know all of the people. But let's look at the question. So he says, do you think that there is a belief or there was a belief that the inability to find the opposite sex attractive became a hindrance to the flow of power? Well, this is very interesting because, again, we're not a sex cult. We're not going to find people attractive or not attractive in the circle. I think that people are less attractive naked, really, quite frankly. Than... What, you, want to leave, you want to leave things to the imagination. <laughs> right. And so I don't really think that that's what we're thinking when we're in a, in a, a circle. And that's true about, like, and I think we had that discussion with our veiled priestess about being sky clad. That's uh, where it becomes very, very evident that there is nothing sexual about being sky clad. I, I, I'm not sure. I think that these questions come about on the assumption or maybe the preconception of the idea that everything is very close to the physical world, which is really not because in the circle, we're not that close to the physical. Actually, our aim is to not be. What is the role of arousal? And does the inability to be aroused to the opposite sex cause an issue? Again, not my experience at all, actually. Because arousal, it's, it's a physical reaction yes. to, to sexual attractiveness, right? So you will be aroused because you will think there is a possibility of being attractive sexually towards somebody. That is not where our heads are when we're in a circle. So again, I would not think that that would be the inability of arousal. Um, it's not even a condition, isn't it? I, I might argue in the sense of, well, the, this person is arguing that arousal does indeed equate with sex. And I would probably expand the definition. I think ar arousal makes you stand in attention. And I can be aroused by a noise. I can be aroused by a, a fragrance. And if we, meaning it, it makes me stand at attention and, and it focuses me. So I would argue in that case, I think priests and priestesses should be in a constant state of arousal in the circle. Really? And so they are all standing in attention and highly focused. And that's, again, like what you're saying is that, yes, like that's a physical response. Right. Uh, but we then translate it into a spiritual one. We elevate it. Then there is another one. Are homosexuals who believe they are better suited to homogeneous groups because their full sexual arousal slash power is not inhibited justified? If one thinks that then like witchcraft at its is just a, a, a sex cult, 
then I could understand, yeah. all right, so therefore maybe just a, you know, a, a homosexual or cult or organization or ritual practice, and it's just based on sex, then I can understand that. But we're not, right? So we're, we're a fertility cult and we understand about polarity. And that's what we're really working. And in my experience, you know, my sexuality in no way it inhibits that flow uh, between the sexes. And then we have to thank Mr. I Spy 13 for answering this because he, he actually answered very well here, saying that we don't really know what Gardner's thoughts are. No, you don't. <laughs> we don't. don't. And, you know, it is also true that the rumors that are floating around about what he thought at the time, it's just speculation because we weren't there. We don't know. No. And, and and when it's reported by somebody, it's always somebody that fell off with him. Anyway, so let's jump into tradition. There is many definitions of tradition, yeah. right? So there's definitions according to social sciences. There is definitions according to religious studies. What, what do you think that it's a good definition that could fit? I would say that a tradition is a set of beliefs and practices that are handed down, whether that be, you know, person to person within families, within cultures, and oftentimes handed down in, in generations. What would you think that we are a tradition? I know that we called this the Alexandrian tradition of witchcraft, and that's the, the what we all go for, the Alexandrian tradition of witchcraft. Okay. Really not the Alexander's tradition of Wicca. That is a different thing because it's a different way of actually saying it. And I think Brian was here in the last episode and he talked about this and he said, uh, we seceding words and Wicca and, and put other words on. And witchcraft is very important to be at the end of it because it's really actually witchcraft. Again, I cannot use that word in Portuguese, because if I go to translate this into Portuguese, literally, the word witchcraft, which translates into bruxeria in yes. Portuguese, it's really not very well received and historically not yep. well received. So I, I couldn't. And I might translate it into Wicca, but it's it's a different it's a different thing. So I think that witchcraft is the best way of defining what we do. Uh, and then Brian brings this idea of religion of witchcraft. Do you think that, how, how do you think that religion fits in this? Well, the, the whole debate of, you know, the difference between Wicca and witchcraft and witchcraft as a practice versus witchcraft as a, as a religion. The way that we are looking at it is that as British traditional witches founded by Gardner, that this is a religion first and foremost, that has then magical practices that accompany it. And then, and then we are a tradition. So therefore we do have certain prescribed beliefs and practices that have been carried down from one to another, initiate to initiate, coven to coven since the 1940s. And what do you think? It really is very important for us to begin to understand that the definition, it's only not just one. I think that religion is a relationship and a system, a religious system. So we have liturgy, for instance. We have a relationship or some kind of communication or some devices and some strategies and some ritual to communicate with the gods and sometimes with other beings as well. So there is a relationship between man and divinity. And of course, you know, out of that relationship and out of worship comes the magic. And that's why I think that we are a religion. By this statement alone, we are a religion. In the 21st century, there are many people, I'm just going to paint with a really broad brush, you probably shouldn't do that. But there are many people, and especially in the United States of America, that cringe yeah. Um, when they hear the word religion, because they immediately think of, you know, Christianity, Judaism, they think of Islam, they, they think of really controlled institutions of power, for, for example, and therefore they're trying to get away from that, and then are crafting maybe their own sort of, you know, DIY <laughs> religions, you know, do it, do it yourself, whether that be, I'm just spiritual, I work with crystals. So I, or I am a witch, but I don't believe in any deity and I just practice magic. I think it's, it's this like, what do I want to say? Sort of a rebuttal to organized religion. But there, but the, the irony is, is that so many people 
are actually searching for religion and spiritual meaning in their lives. If you go to, for instance, Encyclopedia Britannica, it is, it's very clear that this is about a relationship that is established between a human, human beings, which they regard this relationship between a being, an other being, that is regarded as holy or sacred or spiritual or divine or worth of any special reverence whatsoever. So it's it's really, th this is just by this little piece, it is true from all religions uh, yes. that we know, uh, including the, the, the Hellenistic, uh, Greek, the 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 pagan the calvinism the celtics the christianity the confucianism the taoism i mean all of this considered to be because of this relationship so it it isn't just exclusively of one so i think that we can actually define ourselves as a religion absolutely, absolutely. Yep. and if you don't know you can buy kebrian kane's new book that is coming up soon yeah, the religion of witchcraft like the religion in August, because you can pre-order right on. <laughs> yes, uh, give a give up give a plug. Uh, Own.com for thousands of years, right? People yes. believing in something that is greater than themselves, and then, as well as believing that the divine also uh, dwells within. You do have a divine spark. Let's delve into our own tradition. So what does it make the Alexandrian tradition of witchcraft? This is really hard because of all covens being independent and autonomous, it's very difficult to to actually define something like this because but there are again, you know, Brian make a point when he was here about difficulty of definition of tradition as a, you know the Alexandrian being a tradition, but very much based on philosophy rather than tradition. But I think that one is inside of the other. I think that philosophy is inside of the tradition because we are Alexandrian tradition of witchcraft. So I would think that philosophy, absolutely philosophy, and we do have the things that Alex changed about this whole thing, you know, that he made sure to change and Maxine from the original Gardnerian template. And, and it's proven that we, you know, it's derived from Gardnerian witchcraft. It's well documented as well. First, the name. How do you think that it came about? It's really, it comes out of Stuart Farrar. Yeah. In the sense of when he's writing What Witches Do, where they're going to make that distinction between, you know, what Gardner was practicing and then what Alex and Maxine were practicing. And they came upon, you know, naming it after Alex, you know, it's, it's yeah. the, Alexandrian, the Alexandrian religion. And Maxine has made it very, very clear that it's not based on the library of Alexandria. So it's, it really is based on, on Alex's name. So basically to write the book, what witches do, he asked that so what are your witches name what, what is the what what would you call you know this um and they came up with alexandrian because the practices and you know the philosophies and this goes back to what brian was speaking about sure. in terms of our tradition embraces like you know philosophies of beauty power and freedom those were so distinctive or, or the practices of alex and maxine were so distinctive that you couldn't put them just under the general heading of, of witchcraft as Gardner practiced it. So it does derive from Gardnerian witchcraft, but it really okay. isn't the same, especially philosophy of the religion itself. So beauty, freedom, and power is actually a philosophy. When we say these things, you know, I, I picture people like, what do you mean? Beauty, <laughs> freedom, and power. <laughs> what do you mean? What do you mean by that? Um, don't give us three words. We don't know what that means. So, but these, each of these words are fundamental for and touch very specific aspects of Alexandrian philosophy. And I think that this is one of the things that we can rely on is the philosophical principle behind them. Yeah. And that's, I think, what Brian was trying to say. But the change was clear, right? So the change and the coming from Gardnerian is clear. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we have many generations of Alexandrians throughout the world. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, there were changes made out of the main 
changes that were done by Alex and Maxine at the time. But the changes or whatever is different should not inhibit or, or change the, the philosophy. So when you change philosophy, then you're not really being truthful to the origin of the of the founders right so no absolutely or of the movement or tradition so i think that when you change substantial things just one example second and third degrees are given together this is an alexandrian philosophy there is a reasoning behind this and there is a philosophical reason behind this and there is a very direct reason why we do it so when you change this, when you change the, and people ask me this, you know, they ask me, they ask me, well, do you think that somebody that it's initiated into the second degree only are, are not Alexandrians? Well, there's a lot of people that are second degree Alexandrians. Yeah. Because that was changed at some point in history. And then of course, you know, you say, oh, are they Alexandrians or are they? Yeah, they might be Alexandrians. I'm not saying that they're not. But they're not as Alex and Maxine intended them to be. Yeah. Because Alex and Maxine, one of the things here, freedom. And freedom has to do with giving you the second and third when you're ready. Yes. And not holding you on a second degree so yeah. that you can be dangling there, waiting yeah. for the high magus and or high priestess to give you the, the third degree when they think that you should. It could be like 20 years from now. That's right. If you are ready at second degree, you should be ready for third. Yes. And what we think about in terms of our tradition is that you should have been trained to the level where second and third are given together. It's a power move, isn't it? Yes. Which, and that was the whole point, right? With Alex and Maxine is to take away those, those controlling elements in, in Gardnerian. And there's, and there's a lot of controlling elements in Gardnerian from, you know, cutting out pages of the Book of Shadows, not being able to copy it completely at times. And right, right there's, there's lots of controls. And that's what Maxine and, and Alex wants to get rid of. Taking this, for instance, as an example, the second and third degree given together is part of this freedom pillar here that yeah. we have in the philosophy of Alexandrian, which, it? Yep. which is beauty, freedom, and power. So we do have freedom as one of the main things that we, that Alex actually and Maxine put it down for, yeah. pass it down to yeah. people. And then what do you think when people actually divide the, the, the whole thing? I'm about transparency in some of this. And I think this is what, you know, this is the, the drive of what we're doing here is to inform seekers and that seekers be armed with questions, right? With, with questions mm -hmm. to ask coven leaders. And one of those questions that I would ask an Alexandrian a coven leader is, do you separate the degrees, second and third, or do you bestow them together? And hopefully that answer would be, yes, we separate them, or on occasion we have to separate them for certain, for certain reasons, or no, we you know, follow what Maxine and Alex had, had, had done, and then we, and we give them together. And therefore, at least the seeker then knows you know, how, that, how that's going to work for them. This is Gardnerian. Gardnerians do the separation, uh, separate yeah. the degrees. Yeah. So why going back to something that was changed deliberately okay. by the founders of the tradition? So we're going backwards, right? So I, I would think, and I don't understand why would that be a valuable thing to opt to do yeah. when it is very clear that this is part of who we are. So I, I don't really understand this. Other than control, because, you know, a second degree, it really isn't a person that would would be able to establish a coven without... No, you're not autonomous. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so they're not autonomous. So they can establish a coven, but they have to be under the supervision of the mother coven. And yep. of course, you know, if they do that, then they're, they're, they're in control. They're in control of that coven. So don't understand why that is done if the person needs to be trained, then give them some time and then give them the second and third together um, according to what we believe. So it's really about belief, isn't it? Um, it's what we and Alex and Maxine believed at the time and, and the reasons why they did it this way. Yeah. What do you think about beauty? Well, beauty is inheritedly something that actually started with them. Um, there's so many things that we do. 
So this is nothing new, right? This nothing is nothing new. new. Look at the temples of Egypt. Look at the temples of Greece. Look at the temples of ancient cultures that were beautiful and proportional. You know, sometimes it would be something connected even with mathematics. They would go and they would build these temples out of calculation, very rigorous calculations and magical numbers and all of those things and magical ratios, because it is it is about the flow of power. Right. So power flows in beauty. So, you know, when I, when I see people coming to ritual with um, ragged robes or, or wrinkled robes, I, I, I think that you want to be your best in front of the gods. And right. um, beauty is one of them. Do you want to be beautify yourself? Absolutely, just beautify yourself. Priestesses would wear makeup. It's wonderful, perfumes, oils, all of those things that are not new. All of the ancient cultures used it. So, and we know this because of the vials that were yes. discovered and and literature and all of those. And this is what also I think a lot of a lot of people need to reconcile whatever animosity they have with Christianity and the Abrahamic religions because it's it's there as well. The, the Gothic cathedrals, they are supposed to be beautiful. They are made in terms of uh, sort of divine mathematical proportions. And what when you enter one, what is supposed to happen to you? It's, it's supposed to elevate your mind where you are no longer in the mundane, right? But now you have entered a space that is reflective of the sacred. So the, these are mysteries, and we can find these mysteries in every single religion uh, that ever was on this planet. The other thing is power, because it was one of the things that Alex and Maxine really worked at was the unapologetic use and obtaining of power. Mm -hmm. And and of course, some people even, when when invited to some circles, they would comment on saying too strong too much <laughs> <laughs> it's it's grown up witchcraft yes it's grown up witchcraft if you're not mature enough get out of here no but it, it but it is i mean it really is and and it, it couldn't knock you over if you're not really you know this is why some of the things that I've hear from the elders, I, I, I hear, you know, not everyone should be initiated, only those that have vocation and discipline that would follow up with, you know, and those who have the courage to be a, a priest of the Alexandrian tradition. It isn't, again, here we are again, right? It, it isn't safe. It's not safe. <laughs> it isn't a, um, a, a, a spiritual retreat. Alexandrian circles are powerful, and they should be that and way. And disciplined, right? We're powerful, we're powerful and disciplined. And beautiful. Um, and, and beautiful. And no apologies about right. power. That is what we're there for. Yeah. And and as Maxine says, and we certainly believe, you know, and it's through the worship comes the magic yes. uh, and the power and that connection to the, and to the divine. There are things that we have that came from Gardnerian tradition and or principles, but they were revised by Alex and Maxine. Autonomy is one of them with the second and third degree given together, which gives us the autonomy to that person to either stay or leave with Haivov, as we say, yep. leave that mother coven and found another one and take whomever they want with them. If, if people want to go with them, they can go with them. And then another coven is formed out of that one. Why is what is autonomy for you? And and of course, you know, we talked about this ad nauseum almost. But I think that it's important for us to talk about responsibility, but responsibility in various levels, not just responsibility. Oh, I'm responsible for this new group that I'm founding, that I'm starting. But what are you actually responsible for? As a, as a third degree. I am responsible for the passing on of that tradition as it was taught to me and how that links all the way back to our, our founders. And I am responsible to teach my initiates that tradition. And I think that's probably my greatest responsibility as a third degree. And then autonomy, how that layers on it, I don't think autonomy gives me a free pass in terms of then just changing the tradition as I want to 
as I want to see it. Now, being maybe a little bit long-winded here, I think it's normal for first-degree initiates, not all, but first-degree initiates to be in, in a coven and then start to get a little itchy after a while where they do want to sort of run their own group and maybe run it in their own way in terms of maybe teaching practices or, or develop certain rituals. And I think that's a sort of a normal growth that can happen. However, being autonomous does not mean that I can now go and, you know, well, I'm just going to go change the names of the gods. Actually, why even have a male and female god? Eh, I'm just going to do, you know, two males. Uh, or I'm going to do two females because that's how I, how, I, how I view it. So that is not what I think what we mean by autonomy. Autonomy is, and this is like, and this goes back to our elders, right? Where if you're going to change something, there really has to be a valid, tested, concerted reason that either you're changing or really you're enhancing it. You're fine tuning. And that's where I see a coven autonomy. I think that when you're giving the second and thirds, you are supposed to have had your training, all mm -hmm. of your training. Yep. Um, up to that point. And of course, you know, people think that because there are second and third or there's thirds now that they know everything. Absolutely you know? not. Uh, yeah. And, and that's, and that's just, a problem if you think you do. That's right. So let's not forget that you were initiated yesterday. You have <laughs> no experience whatsoever as a third. It, it, yes. It bestows no brand new knowledge. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And, but, but ego. Ego. Ego comes to the surface or could come to the surface naturally. And um, that's when problems become problems. I know better. I have a better solution. I am going to change this because I think that this is the best way to do it. And who cares about the founders? Who cares about the philosophy? Let's just change it. Good. The other thing is I see a lot of changes go back to what gardenerians are doing. So instead of... <laughs> we, we kind of like changed for a reason. So why are we going back to what they do? Well, for that, why are you an Alexander? Why don't you go and be a Gardnerian? That would be great because then you are calling yourself exactly what you are because you are changing things backwards. You're not inventing anything, right? No, you're not inventing anything. It comes out of the immaturity because I think it's that thing of like, let me just pull this whole truck apart and see what's coming out of it. And then let's just let me just remind people that sometimes when we take things apart, sometimes there are little pieces that are missing. Are left over. And you They're left over. We don't it. know where to put them. Um, <laughs> I know, and that's and it's true. It's like it, it, it it's immaturity, and then I guess yeah. at its worst, it's ignorance. Yeah, at and its that worst, is, and that yeah. is why there is there is good training. And there is bad training. And anyone right. who tells you otherwise, they are incorrect. Because there are many ignorant witches out there yes. Um, yes. who don't really understand what they are practicing or saying. Another thing that it's really interesting about this, it's there is no necessity for both high priest and high priestesses to be in a coven. A coven can be run by just one of them. Either one is sufficient. And that is not what gardenerians do. No. Um, they do need both. So we don't. We actually do not do that. And so I don't really know what you have to say about this, but this is one of the things that is part of the philosophy as well. You are independent to actually run your own group, not, not needing, if you are a high priest, not needing a high priestess necessarily. Of course, yep. you're going to have priestesses yep. uh, that work with you. They could be high priestesses or could be just priestesses, but you can have more than one working with you. And that actually has some advantages in terms of experience, I think. The same for the priestess. The high priestess can run the group without a high priest and work with many high priests and or priests for that matter. And that enriches the experience of everyone, I think. But there are Alexandrian covens who have both, just because they're a couple or just because they're, they decided to, to do it. But it's not necessary. That's one of the things that we do. Well, and I guess this is, goes on to like dogma. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like is, is 
Alexandrian witchcraft, is it dogmatic or is it not dogmatic? Can we escape dogma? Because everyone seems to want to escape dogma. <laughs> I don't know if you can escape dogma and religion. So this I'm is going... a loaded question. Are we dogmatic? In ancient traditions, uh, and I'm talking about pre-Christian, classic, mm -hmm. Egyptian, Greek. Mm -hmm. um, I think that dogma was always part of, of what, because dogma is belief. Yes. You know, it's a, the belief in, or it can be belief, the belief in this or that, the belief on the existence of gods, the belief on existing of more than one god, mm -hmm. the belief on, on the existence of the goddess and her power. Yeah. You know, and all of this is, it's dogma. If you don't believe in the goddess, if you don't believe in the god, and if you don't believe in the pair that is needed for anything to really manifest in the universe, then you're not thinking as a, an Alexandrian or a, even a, you know, a priest. <laughs> a priest. It's it's not really so. We we're, we're afraid of this. We're afraid of dogma because dogma was you know coined as a ex libris almost of the Christian faith, and many people are still dramatized. They're still resolving their own, you know. They're still trying to cut the chains of their own luggage. But it, it's very important for people to understand that dogma is not necessarily a bad thing. It's actually defines no. things it, absolutely it, the, you know you you believe in the god and the goddess it unifies things and their relationship i can't imagine somebody you know an atheist for instance to absolutely be initiated into alexander it would be shocked no. um but you know but but these are things that we do believe we we also believe you know in the in the power of other things for instance like i don't know magic Exactly. <laughs> if you don't believe in magic and if you don't really think that magic works, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Yeah. If you don't believe it <laughs> you don't believe in a magic circle. What are you doing here? If you don't believe in the power of the magic circle, what are you doing here? So yeah. there are there are certain things that um are dogmatic principles that we have that we <laughs> we need to we need to acknowledge as dogmatic. There they are. And you know, the, just stop with this movement of oh, there's no dogma for God's sakes. There no, is. and there is. Yeah, we do have common dogmatic beliefs. Within, yeah, right. Within we the, do. Yeah, we no, do. Alexander tradition is initiatory, of course, but we do must request initiation. So people must request initiation. Nobody goes out in the street and say, "Who wants to be an Alexandrian?" That doesn't happen. No. And so when people offer you initiation, you should be very suspicious about it. So you have to ask. And you, and you have to, and sometimes you have to knock on the door more than once. Well, it, the you need to ask yeah. is really a translation of you have to manifest your will of wanting to be that or wanting anything else actually in the mm -hmm. in the craft because in the Alexandrian tradition and philosophy you know of the Alexandrian tradition this is one of the things that I was taught very early on is that everything has to be asked for oh, where where I, I, I have certainly forgotten in in some instances this tenant and be like I didn't ask and there, there, that's right that's why right. I did not receive <laughs> Ask and you shall receive. Yes. And exactly. sometimes not. You can ask and sometimes yeah, well, you know. You don't um, receive. <laughs> but you have, but sometimes you don't receive. But you <laughs> must ask. You're absolutely You must yeah. ask. And sometimes you ask and there's conditions. Yes. You know. Yes, but. Blah, and I, blah, think blah. This is, I think this might be, and again, I don't want to paint with a broad brush, but I think this might be even more difficult for Americans because we are raised with this, you know, quote unquote, sort of politeness where you're, you're afraid to ask for things that you want. Um, maybe that's changing now. I guess that's how I how I grew up. There's this sort of politeness or or, your, or like reservation to be pushy. Right. And to ask. But you, you know, but you actually have to be. You too. It has to be an expression you're, of your will. Right. Initiation oaths, for instance, they do emphasize freedom of everything. So. 
there is there is some initiation. I was talking about this in the last episode when I did an initiation that we don't really reinitiate people unless there is very specific things, and that was one of the things. It was an anomaly on the oath that made me opt yeah. for a reinitiation because that oath was a coercive oath. Yeah. And I had to, okay, so we have to just redo this. And and it, it really was that. So, you know, people sometimes don't really do it. You have to be very careful with this. And it's very easy and dangerous, actually, because I could, for instance, change the initiation right ever so slightly to yeah. just coerce somebody of a very, very little detail. And that would change it immediately because we're all about freedom and giving back. Everything is about emphasizing freedom. And if I change that, who would know? And that's really terrifying, honestly. And I think it's also one of those, because there are unscrupulous people in the yes. world, right? And there are certainly unscrupulous high priests and high priestesses right. uh, within the tradition. And the initiate would not know. The, the initiate would not know if the high priest or high priestess changed changed the the wordings yes. right, of the of the oath. And then what are you actually pledging? Right. right, right. So this can be very dangerous. And and you 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 can only know this after you contact others, which you shouldn't because no no socializing rule. <laughs> you shouldn't. That's yes. But you know, like, how do I know then? Because, you know, this in this case, in my case, the, the priest came to me and said, uh, this was my initiation right. And he actually had the initiation right in a page. And I could see that immediately that that was not an, an Alexandrian initiation right. So I decided to make it again. But only then, because there is no other way. Yeah. How would you know? So I'm being initiated for the first time. <laughs> the cousin, yeah. and I don't know what is being said, and I'm trusting. You yeah. know, people. the problem here is trust. People really do trust, and as they should. I mean, they should trust, right? We should trust, but absolutely. And, and yes. nine times out of ten, obviously, yeah. trust trustworthy. You know, trustworthy individuals, right? And and it's fine. If you, and we would love to really, really be totally at ease with this, but unfortunately, there are some people that are not that. Yeah, you know. And coven autonomy does not give you the right to change the initiation oath. No. Or by right. The, by that. The right. Right. Yes. So therefore, the coven Coven-tonomy. autonomy does not do this. This is yeah. this is core tradition. Yes. No. So going back to coven autonomy, right? Yeah. Yeah. And people say, okay, I'm autonomous now and I can do whatever I want. So if I, I want to do a Viking, old Viking ritual, let yeah. me just do that because that's what I want to do. And yeah. of course, you know, this is me now being autonomous. That is not autonomy. No. That is not what autonomy is. And that's not what coven work is. Coven work is a natural development of the work of, of each of the covens according to and using the tools and philosophies and training that was given. There's problems on all levels with this. Practicing the tradition... It's supposed to be. A, it's supposed to transform you. You are not supposed to transform the tradition. The tradition is supposed to transform you. But again, in the 21st century, a lot of people are uncomfortable with this concept because they have ego. Look at all the selfies people post of them of themselves, and they want ritual and in ritual, right? It's me, me, right? Me, me, me. Look me, at me I, and my candles. I, Look at me and my pentacle. Look at me and my chest. Yes, right. And it's all about the it's all about the self. So it's all about so yeah. it's all about ego. And I know, and I would say, and I would argue though, within that transformation, yeah, things too can evolve, right? Sort of evolve yeah. naturally. Mm -hmm. And then I think it's also just unsound occult practice to want to go and then immediately change everything because. When you are adhering to the tradition, when you're adhering to our rituals, when you're adhering to our, you know, God names, you have to understand there is power behind that stream. So to go in and to be like, you know what, today it's going to be Odin and Thor or whatever. And then like, so, so yeah. now you're like tapping into something that's never really done. Right. And, and, or maybe someone, someone did. in witchcraft, Alexandrian witchcraft, right. Ritual. And now you're kind of like on your own. 
you're sort of you're sort of on on a sea without any sort of anchor or more. And then I would say good luck with that. Opposite to this, what would be the sequence of a coven work that would be translated into okay, so this coven is autonomous and they are actually working the magic and they're working and they're developing their work mm -hmm. without of course, you know, separating degrees and, you know, goodness knows what else. Yeah. Um, because, you know, covens are autonomous and totally secret, so we don't really know what's going on. You don't, no. But, you know, why? What? And what, what we know out of this is the people that come out of this, mm -hmm. and then they talk to you. And then you say, well, but that's not, that's not Alexandrian. Yeah. Oh, we did that. Yeah. Every single Sabbath we did it. Yeah. Or guest, right? Oh, or can, my God. What? Or you, can, or you can guest into a coven and be like, what's happening here? What's happening here? Yeah. Like, it could be really, and that could be good or bad, or it could be really foreign. Foreign. Well, that, you know, the, if, the, if the training is similar, just like we said last episode, you will recognize most of the things, like 99% of the things you will know what's going on. But, you know, what is that work? That work of the coven that makes it, okay, so now you're autonomous, and what, what does that mean? Well, that means that you can run your group as you so choose, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to initiate this person, that person, that person, you can, because it's your choice of choosing, and it's part of your own learning mm -hmm. to choose the right people for your group. Yes. You know, not, as a high priest easy. group and high priestess. That is part of your, that is being autonomous. You don't have to yep. ask anyone, what do you think? Yep. Because you can. Yep. And you have the ability to be vouched for and have the power to initiate others, right? The reason why first degrees cannot have a covenant is because they don't, they can't really initiate anyone. No. Other than when there is a third degree present. Yeah. So, Coven autonomy is this, is you run your group as, as, as you wish, right? So you choose whomever, you choose the line of work. Do you want to work more in healing? Do you want yeah. to work with colors? Or... Or... Yes. So, and you're free to explore that things. Like for instance, I know Maxine explores immensely the, the work with color. Yes, and that was that was something that they did. I mean, this is you know for for various applications of of things, and that is a wonderful work that could be developed. This is coven work. Yes, it's not separating degrees. No, it's not not doing or whatever. It is or changing the initiation or changing. No, it's productive. Exactly. It's productive yeah. work. Absolutely. So productive work means that you are actually adding or exploring something. And then you have to say, okay, is this working? No. Yeah, never. And sometimes discard. All Absolutely. right, so let's discard it and let's explore another approach. This is what magical work is about. Yeah. And this is what the work of the coven should be. Yeah. Um, a, a natural development of their own abilities and taking advantage of the people that are part of the coven and, and finding out the tone of the magic that is to be done. And, you know, some covens are a little bit more ceremonial, some are a little bit more folksy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's okay. But they're not separating the legs out of the frog. I mean, they're not ripping it off and just say, okay, jump. Oh, well, it, no, it's a little difficult. Doesn't have the legs. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's pretty obvious to me that sometimes this, this idea of autonomy just went over the heads of people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's not their necessarily their fault. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, it's right. It, it's easier. I guess it's easier to like, well, I was going to separate the degrees or it's easier to, I'm going to change the names of the gods. Actually, I'm just going to do two gods. It's easier <laughs> to make these types of adjustments rather than yeah. actually developing your practice. Then there is this phrase, that very wise phrase that we say, we have few secrets and many mysteries what do you think about this the craft is an experiential religion so we and this is this is i think this is well well known in the sense of you know alex you know said you know i could i could hand anyone the book of shadows um and so therefore you can read it page uh you know beginning beginning to end so therefore no secrets there here here, here is everything 
however, would you be able to to work it? Would you be able to experience what you're supposed to experience from it? And then that's those are the mysteries. The awareness of this is very evident when we talk about, you know, sometimes people are very afraid of first degrees are here. We can't talk about that. We have very profound conversations with first degrees and, you know, and everyone is in, you know, the conversation is not exclusive. They're all initiates. And if they don't understand it, they will ask why or what is that? And then an answer will be given. So why can't we just discuss, you know, so we have few secrets. I mean, very few, very few secrets kept from a first degree for, yeah, absolutely what you're saying. Very few secrets actually kept from a first degree. Otherwise, no. Like, I think our approach is that first degrees are full-fledged priests and priestesses. Mm -hmm. So there is an emphasis on mysteries over the secrets. Remember in the second episode, I think, of our podcast, when I say that I have first degrees helping on the third degree. Yes. Yeah. Yep. How dare yeah, how dare you? <clears throat> and that's 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 just tr- you know breaking the tradition. But it's yes, not. <laughs> it's not. It's not actually. No. But yes. So and and I can hear people say, oh, absolutely not. <laughs> but the truth is that we do emphasize the experience, the belief in personal experience that is necessary for the attaining of some consciousness about some aspects of the tradition. And I think that passes through that. So it's it's the it's the practice, right? That yeah. brings us that that consciousness. I, I think too, I think there are some individuals out there and you know, I could probably be even guilty of this is where, yeah, I want to learn the secrets, right? I wanna I wanna learn everything that, you know, not everybody gets so readily or I want to be part of every tradition because I want to learn all of those secrets. Um, and I think that individual then ends up not experiencing and understanding the mysteries. Just so focused on like secret and the accumulation of knowledge, but on a very sort of surface level. Now, the other thing I think that it's rather interesting about us. <laughs> we love us. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, it's versus them. We were, exactly. Ego. You were accused of encouragement of respecting other craft traditions and major religions. So there is an encouragement for respect over other craft traditions and major religions. There are many there are many paths to the divine. And then it's up to the individual who chooses to seek the divine to That's follow right. that path, right? That resonates with them. And I don't care what that is, right? What it's your own homemade religion, or it's something very, very, very traditional that's been around for you know s- several millennia. However, what I would have, what I do have an issue with, is someone who's claiming to be I am an Alexandrian and not practicing anything that looks like Alexandrian, or I am a Catholic and I am not practicing anything that looks like Catholicism. That is what's problematic. Otherwise, yeah. absolutely, I'm. Uh, I think we're totally respectful of uh, every and all other paths to the divine. Yes. The other thing is that we do follow the Book of Shadows. We uh, do. Some people actually dismiss the Book of Shadows and exactly. or don't think that it's worth copying. Imagine. Um, <laughs> oh, there is. Somebody. I don't understand, but I don't understand that. Well, then yeah. why bother? Go, go to the bookstore. Go to the bookstore. I don't know, pick up some books in the occult section and then have at it. Yes. Then you don't then you don't need this tradition. Yeah. Well, we do work the eight ways of magic. We do uh, the dance, the breath, and all of those things that we do as the eight ways. And we do do that. But there are variations introduced by Alex and Maxine that were very, very clear on the use of those eight ways. So we do work that. And there are people who don't. They don't really work those. But one of the things that I think that they introduced, especially Maxine and Alex, to consciously to this was the ritualistic emphasis on conscious action within the circle, which I think that it's something that really doesn't exist often in other circles or in other groups or in other traditions. And this requires also training 
So it's something that really is very interesting to look at and to contemplate the ritualistic emphasis on conscious action within. Well, it probably even relates back to our YouTube question about arousal. I think that that is arousal, right? In, in that in that regard, everything has an intention. <laughs> yes, and elevate like and and you're elevating your consciousness. Yes, what well, you are you are aroused, and there's meaning behind it. Yeah. So. The other thing is that when seekers come to us, and this is something that was done as well by Alex and Maxine, we suggest to them to seek multiple groups and yes. so they find the right for them. Good. And so we don't say, oh, sure, come on in. And that's not how it works. Before they come to us, definitely, they should be seeking other groups. Then they will come to us. Yeah. And then... Again. And I hope seekers understand, and this is just, I'll speak for myself, that is not me closing the door on a seeker. No, it's that's giving me them... Being, that's me yeah. being a responsible priest and initiate, suggest to them, no, you really need to speak to many, many yeah. groups before deciding. Yeah. Yes. So overwhelming quest for initiation into the circle of witchcraft, the vocation. I want to be initiated into the circle of witchcraft I cannot help it. I have to. That's yeah. vocation. That is vocation. And, and then, of course, you know, uh, you know, it's just the, then there are there are other things that they, you know, there are people, there are opinions about vocation being rewarded. What is it? Oh, vocation can only be paid for it, right? If there's more. actually salary. No, that's not true. No, that that's historically inaccurate. Yeah. Yeah. So. Sorry. <laughs> just <laughs> sorry. Just but making just making just hats. Yeah. Overwhelming quest for so that's vocation. And that's what we meant when we say vocation. Suggestion of the inevitable influence of magic. We do believe in magic. We do. We don't believe in magic, don't even think about it. Don't even think we are a magic. <laughs> <laughs> don't even. Don't even don't think waste about your time it. writing that email. Don't. It's a waste of capabytes. Don't <laughs> invent. <laughs> yeah.